right, everyone, go ahead and have a seat. Head back to your chairs. Hopefully you had a chance to get up, stretch a little bit. We got a little bit more, and then we're going to have some delicious Chick-fil-A lunch for you. All ready to go. And then we'll spend some time doing some Q&A, which will be exciting. It'll be fun. We're excited to be here. Uh, I hope you're excited as we are about this, uh, about this topic, about everything that we're talking about. And I don't know about you, but one of the uh, just most fun stages in a kid's life is where my kids are at right now, and that is the pretend kind of dress-up phase. It's just really fun coming home and seeing, being greeted by a fairy princess and Spider-Man and a cat. It's just, it's pretty cute. It's fun. It's enjoyable. I never know what's going to happen. Uh, sometimes I walk around a corner and my son is a knight with a sword and a shield and he's ready to fight. Uh, so I taught him the right rules of engagement. You have to stay on guard. You have to have, they have to be equipped. So if he starts a sword fight with you, you can let him know, hey, I did not agree to this. We did not stay on guard. No, no. Also, you know how to start a fight with him if you need to. But they love to dress up. Uh, my wife got them a, a little box where they kind of keep all of those things, all the fun princess dresses and things like that for my girls, uh, the, the sword and shield and Spider-Man stuff for my son. Uh, and they love doing that. But the problem is usually when they do that, it creates a bit of a mess. Um, if you have seen kids' rooms after they have played in the rooms, or like just destroyed the rooms, uh, it can get pretty messy. Uh, stuff's everywhere. Uh, there's a princess tiara on the floor. There's Hot Wheels tracks that were being used as weapons. There's a whole bunch of stuff all over the place. And usually what we will do as responsible parents, my wife and I will say, hey, your job now is to clean this up. You're in charge. I need to go make dinner. I need to go uh, get the, the house ready for someone to come over. I need to go do this. Your job right now is to clean up your room. Sadly, many times when we come back, we will hear, uh, we will see that the room has not been cleaned up. And that is just a clear disobedience. And our kids know there are consequences. If you do not obey, you don't do what we said. Sometimes, though, they'll try to come up with other ideas. Well, yeah, we didn't clean up, but we got dressed for the day. Huh? Well, that was pretty good. You like it when we do that. Sometimes they will come in. Uh, we will walk in the room, and they'll say, we'll say, hey, why didn't you clean up? You were supposed to be cleaning. It's still just as messy. Oh, well, I was reading to my little sister. Oh, isn't that so cute? See, I know you like it. You smile when I do that, so I know you like it. Sometimes as I'm uh, maybe making breakfast in the morning, uh, they will come out and they will say, hey, can I help you make breakfast? I like making breakfast. I want to be with you. Uh, I want to uh, spend time with you. And I say, that's great. Did you do what I told you to do? Did you obey? And I'll, many times, sadly, they're, they're getting better. They're growing. They're learning. Uh, but many times they don't obey. But man, those times when they do obey, how great is that as a parent? Uh, even as a, a babysitter, maybe you're just stopping by and you're hanging out with some kids. Man, how good is it when they obey and they do what they've been told to do? I think for Christians, we should hopefully look at what we have been tasked with as our king, our Lord has gone away, handed down to us a commission and said, hey, this is your job. This is the one thing I want you to focus on. This is what you should be known for. This is what you should be all about because this is what I'm all about. This is what I'm telling you to be all about. I think a lot of times, sadly, we will look at that and say, oh, well, yeah, I know, God, I'm, I'm supposed to be sharing the gospel. I know I'm supposed to, Matthew 28, go out and make disciples. I know even in the beginning of the book of Acts, uh, in Acts 1, where your spirit came on, uh, the people, uh, or before that happened, before uh, Jesus left the earth, uh, and he told the people, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you so that you may go testify to the nations, starting uh, in, in the, or you're going to be my witnesses. A uh, very similar idea right there, basically the same thing. Uh, and you're going to go to uh, Judea, Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. 
that is what our goal should be. And sometimes we can get caught up in the, okay, well, I'm doing these other good things, but we're not doing what the main thing is. I hope that we recognize that's a foolish way to live. That'll be very sad when we come before God one day and say, well, but but God, look at all these other things I did. And God says, but you didn't do what I told you to do. Now, he's told us a lot of things. We are to uh, be in the church. Uh, That's why uh, we have these main ideas of upward, inward, and outward. We don't want to um, dismiss any of those things. We don't want to ignore any of those areas of our lives. But I hope that especially as we look outward, which should be a major portion of our life, that we get excited about it. We think forward to, man, what is God going to do in this time when I am faithful to share his word? How is God going to act when this person hears the gospel? What is God going to say when I stand before him? I know what he's going to say. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of your master. That's what he's going to say, and that's what I want to hear. That's what I want for all of you guys. So as we uh, have been looking specifically at one way, a specific tool to use towards evangelism, I hope that you see, man, there's a real need to do this. There should be a joy and excitement uh, as we go out and share the gospel. But also, what a powerful tool God has given us in our testimonies we truly understand what our testimony is. It is the, um, the oh, I forgot how he put it, uh, Pastor Matt, the salvation biography, I think is what that was. A salvation biography. Man, as we get to go and share that with people, what an impactful, powerful tool we have in that. And we want to use our um, testimonies well. And so what I want to do here after we've heard, okay, let's clarify what a testimony is. Let's look at our own testimonies, make sure that it follows. As we start to evaluate testimonies, uh, beginning with ourselves, as Pastor Elliot said, and then looking at others and uh, how can I help people walk through this? How can I be able to challenge people on this using God's word? Now let's think about, okay, how do I genuinely implement this in my life, if this is such a great weapon, if this is such a uh, powerful tool that God has given me, how do I go and use it in an evangelistic conversation? So to do that, we're going to flip to uh, a great example of this in Acts chapter 22. So if you have your Bible, turn over to Acts chapter 22 as we talk about this uh, very important aspect, uh, this important incredible tool that God has given to us. Let's open up there. We have Paul here who is talking. There we go. Paul here who is uh, talking to the people, and we're jumping right in the middle of a very action-packed scene. If you're familiar with Acts chapter 22, uh, or if you're familiar with math or numbers, it follows right on the heels of Acts 21. Uh, In Acts 21, Paul is in Jerusalem after uh, having gone on his missions trips. Uh, He's gone out, shared the gospel to many people, and he comes back to Jerusalem, uh, and he is walking around in the temple. Some people see him. They recognize him from those areas that he had been preaching to, the Jews and the Gentiles, they recognize him and they say, oh, that's the guy. That's the guy who's, uh, that we don't like, who, who's preaching Christ. Let's go get him. So they stir up a big crowd. They go, they start tearing him apart. They're literally attempting to kill him right then and there. The Romans who are in charge, the governmental authorities, the soldiers, essentially the police of that day, they see what's going on and they're like, We probably don't want murder happening in the streets, so let's go do something about this. They go grab Paul, drag him away. Uh, He's not even really able to walk by himself. And so that is where we get here. And if you are in 22, uh, just look back a few verses right above that to Acts 21, verse 37. That is what uh, has been happening. You can even look at verse 36. The mob of the people were following. It was a violent crowd, and they're crying out, away with him, meaning kill him, put that guy to death. We want this guy dead. Verse 37 says this, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And the tribune says back to him, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who uh, recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? 
Paul replies, no, I'm not that guy. I am a Jew from Tarsus of Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hands to the people. When there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language. That sets up what we're about to talk about. Now, Paul, uh, as I went through this in Foundations last year, it was so exciting getting to talk with all these things about the kids, how faithful Paul was, what a great job he did. But one thing that struck me and is still just uh, amazing in my mind today is in this instance where there is a mob trying to kill Paul, Paul's number one thought, his number one aim is not my safety, is not, yeah, soldiers, please spirit me away over to this other area where they can't get to me. No, it's, hey, you know what? There's a whole bunch of people who would probably listen right now. So, hey, can I talk to them? I'd love to share the gospel with these people. That's his mindset. In a literally life or death situation, there is a mob trying to kill him. And Paul says, man, I want to share the gospel right now. That is what he is all about. And that is what, as Christians, we should be all about as well. As we look at Paul, as we see his heart, we should have that same kind of heart. So we're going to look through this and we're going to just take uh, elements of what he does and we're going to put them into practice. So uh, if you have uh, notes that you're taking down, you can write it down this way. Be ready and willing to evangelize. Ready and willing even in situations where maybe you're thinking, oh, this is, this is a tough situation. He literally was just being beat by tens, maybe a hundred people. Who knows how many people this is? This is a large mob by tens of people being beat, probably tried to rip him apart, doing all the things to try to kill him. He's probably not physically feeling too good, but he's like, man, I want to share the gospel. I need to get the gospel out. We need to have that same kind of mindset. And where is he going to go? He's going to go into his testimony. So the second thing that you need to write down, a little sub point there, is to not sit on your testimony. Like I said, this is a powerful tool God has given you. This is a way that you can easily and coherently and clearly show the saving power of God. Why would we not use that? It is such an incredible spiritual weapon. Uh, I love how uh, it's put uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. Uh, part of our job is to do this. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh... We're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Do you recognize, Christian, that your testimony is a spiritual weapon that can be used to take thoughts captive to Christ, to make people aligned with Christ, to destroy the arguments of uh, self-righteousness, to destroy the arguments of uh, the idolatry that is out there. You can destroy those, rip them down with your testimony. And again, it is not of you because your story is so great. You're not the hero, like we said but it's the power of God. That's what's on display in your testimony. This is a powerful spiritual weapon. Now, as we see that, we want to look back to see how Paul is going to use this testimony. If you look back, uh, again, still in chapter 21, I promise we will get to chapter 22. But in chapter 21, if you go back to verse 27 and 28, see a little bit of the situation that I was telling you. It says, when the men, uh, when the seven days were complete, Paul is purifying himself, seven days are complete, he shows back up at the temple. The Jews from Asia, who were the Jews who had been persecuting Paul, trying to kill him, kicking him out of all their cities, they see him in the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. There are great and grave accusations going against Paul. I'm not surprised by the people trying to put him to death because that's 
Technically, what should happen? If someone were to defile the temple like this, they should be put to death. And they are saying, uh, this guy's going around and he's teaching everyone against the people, against the law, against this place. This guy is anti-God. This guy's anti-Yahweh. This guy's anti-Jew. What does Paul say? How is he going to use and implement his testimony in this? Well, the very first thing that he does, sorry, technical difficulties here. The very first thing that he does is he addresses them in the Hebrew language. If you skip down, well, let's start in chapter 22. He says this, brothers and fathers. He's coming in humbly as we should, as Pastor Elliot said, as Pastor Matt said. That's how he comes in. He's talking to everyone, brothers, fathers. I'm not above you. I'm not better than you. I am with you. Some of you deserve respect over me. I'm going to call you a father. Hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. Oh, wait a minute. This guy, uh, I thought this guy was some uh, random Gentile. Oh, he, he's a Jew? He knows our language? Okay, let's, let's talk to this. Let's talk to this guy. Let's see what he has to say. He starts out, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in the city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers. I am a Jew just like you guys. Where does Paul start with his testimony? He starts right here by gaining credibility and diffusing the situation. Sometimes people, you will have an evangelistic conversation with someone and they will have just incredible prejudices against you, against the name of Christ, against the church, against whatever. And sometimes you do need to diffuse that. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says, or do you not know, Pastor Elliot was referencing it earlier, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, uh, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Some people have such strong uh, opinions about Christians because of what they see in the media, because of what they see and experience by people who call themselves Christians who are not truly Christian, by maybe situations that they have been in with Christians uh, who sin against them and don't handle it the right way. Don't come back to them in repentance and ask for forgiveness from them. They can have a lot of problems. You need to be thinking as you start to think, how do I implement my testimony? It can start out with, how can I help them listen to what I have to say? What's going to turn them off to what I have to say. If I start saying, man, yeah, I'm so smart that I figured this out. I'm so wise. God picked me and I'm so great. Yeah, I can see why people immediately start to shut off and I don't want to listen to that. I don't need to listen to you brag. I don't need to hear about your pride. But man, when we come in and we say, hey, I'm just like you. I'm a sinner that needed to be saved as well. I'm not better than you. I, didn't, uh, I wasn't smarter. I wasn't anything like this. Some people keep come in with a thought of, uh, man, Christians are just so holier than thou. They think they're all so great and they're all so perfect. And in your testimony, how are you going to share, I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I have been washed from those things. Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail about those sins. And I'm not perfect right now. One day I will be, but not at the moment. But how can you show them, no, I, I don't rely on my own righteousness. I don't even want to talk about my own righteousness. You know what I want to talk to you about? Christ's righteousness. It's his story. He's the one who saved me. It's not because of me. Some people think that Christians are just so high and mighty. Uh, you guys think you're the best. You think you're so self-important. No, I, I submit to a great God. That's what gives me importance. Because I am a child of that God. I'm a servant of that God. I am a slave of that God. And if you start saying that I have a high view of myself as I call myself a slave, I don't, I don't know how to correct that in your minds. You don't know the definition of the word slave. 
Some people think that Christians are just hypocrites. What does Paul say here in verse 5? It says, as the, the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. Starts talking about other people and he says, hey, you can talk to those people and check out about my life. You can ask them about my life. He's going to show I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not doing these things uh, out of just whatever. Uh, later on in verse 9, as he goes and explains his convert, the point of conversion, at conversion, that middle portion of Ephesians, he starts to explain, hey, uh, the, there were other people with me when this happened. You can go talk to them. You can check up on it. This is really helpful when you start to think of how you share your testimony with relatives who know you well. With, uh, I think of my uncles and aunts, my cousins, who have been there since the beginning, since I was a little kid running around their house and probably causing mayhem and mischief. And how they can so easily look down on me and just say, oh man, this is just a kid. I know him. I, I know he's not perfect. Man, how can I gain credi credibility with them? Look at my life. Do you see how my life was this way and now it's this way? Do you see how I've changed the conversations that we have? Do you see what's important to me now and it wasn't important then? That's how you can start to implement your testimony. Thinking through, okay, how can I use this to gain this credibility? How can I use it to diffuse the situation if they're angry? If you are worried about being called a hypocrite, I know a lot of people will say, I don't want to put the bumper sticker on my car bumper because of the way I drive. And what do we say every single time? Well, then you need to drive better. You need to drive like a Christian. You need to drive like someone who represents the God of the universe who came down and died for your sins and for mine. That's what you need to do. So if you start to think, oh man, if I tell people, if I tell my coworkers my testimony, and I say that I was saved from this sin, and I start showing that sin again in my life, oof, that, that could be a problem. Okay, well, then that should be even more ammunition for you, more of a, uh, an encouragement, a spur to say, okay, well, I don't want to fight that sin because I don't want them dishonoring God. Because if they see, oh man, his God sa he says he, God saved him from that sin, well, there he goes doing it again. No, I want to show them that this God does save. And when I don't do it rightly, I should go back and I should apologize and explain to them, yeah, I'm not perfect. And I had to go back and ask for forgiveness from my God. And you know what? I'm confident that he will give me strength and I will overcome this sin. That I will find victory. That is how you can start to show your uh, credibility in your testimony. But let's keep going here. Paul isn't trying to just uh, escape the scrutiny, escape difficulty, or even escape, de escape death. He's trying to get the people to listen. So the other side of this is don't defend yourself. When you are implementing your testimony, when you're sharing with people, when you're telling them and you're trying to show them, hey, I'm just like you. Hey, this is why you should listen to me. Don't defend yourself. We don't need to be concerned with our own glory. We want to be concerned with God's glory. What shines a bright and brilliant light on God? How can I do that in my testimony? That's what we need to be thinking. Secondly, as um, Paul continues in his message here, if you look towards the end of three where we stopped, he said, uh, he's uh, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death. Blind, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. Again, I got the receipts. You can go talk to these people. From them, I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those away who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. What does Paul do here? What can we learn from it is we can uh, use our testimony to help explain things, but we need to not get lost in the weeds. Don't get lost in the weeds. Don't get lost in the minutia. Pastor, Elliot, or Pastor Matt said it earlier. I believe Pastor Elliot said it as well, but we're not sharing our testimony to glorify sin. 
We're not sharing our testimony to get them interested in a story and to start saying all of these things. It would have been really easy for Paul to say, okay, I've got them on the hook now. Let me reel them in a little bit more. Hey, you guys, let me tell you about some of the people that I killed. Man, there was this guy, Stephen, and he could have gone into details on how he killed Stephen. He could have gone into details of how he accosted people in the streets who were Christians. Gone into detail about how many people he gathered up and rounded up and brought them into jail and what happened to them and gone into all those details, but he doesn't because that's not the point. The point is, I was wrong with God. I was doing what was evil, what was against God. Now let's see what God did from that. Don't get lost there. Don't get stuck in there. Don't go and divulge all of the sins because that's going to start doing the opposite of what we want to do. We want to gain credibility. We don't want to lose it. I have heard some people talk about their sin, and while we understand that the, the heart is sinful, we, it's not always helpful to go all into that. We, we save that for our accountability groups. That's where we can be helpful and share those things, share those struggles. Don't get lost in the weeds. You have something much, much bigger and important to look at. If you look at verse 6, he continues. He starts into that middle portion of your testimony, the at conversion. It says, As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Those who were with me uh, did, saw the light. They didn't understand the voice who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do? The Lord said to me, rise, go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. What he is using his testimony here for, Paul, he wants to correct the Jewish wrong thinking. The Jews are all sitting there thinking the Messiah has not come yet. We're still waiting for the Messiah, the one who's going to save us. Paul wants to correct that thinking and show them, hey, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. The Jews are thinking only Jews can be Christians and they need to become Jews. Uh, you need to be a proselyte of a Jew so that you can be saved, and that's the only way to salvation. Whereas we have already had in Acts uh, 15, we've had the Council of Jerusalem. No, Gentiles can come in uh, simply by repentance and faith. That is how people are saved. Again, thinking back to 2 Corinthians 10.5, we're destroying arguments, every lost, lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And how does Paul do that? He does it by saying exactly what Jesus told to him. Paul's fighting against those theologies it's helpful in your evangelism as you think, uh, how can I show God's holiness and his justice by showing in my own testimony that God can't just forgive sins. God's not the happy grandpa that'll wipe away our sins and, oh yeah, I know you did a lot of bad things, but for the most part you were good, so yeah, come on in. No, I'm going to show in my testimony if that's how you think, if that's what you believe, that's what you're putting your trust in, I want to show by my testimony that that's not true. I want to show them this is... There is uh, indeed a justice that God has to uphold. There's a holiness. He can't be around sin. And what they need to rightly do to respond to it. While you are doing that, while you are correcting their bad theology, you need to also not introduce confusion. Don't introduce confusion. Don't start to confuse them. I know I said theology in here and their bad theology. This does not mean, <clears throat> excuse me, that as you are implementing your testimony, you also need to exp explain the entirety of the Trinity or make sure that they fully understand and have no misconceptions and no um, confusion or questions about the hypostatic union. Those are not things that are necessary. What's necessary for salvation we can go through, okay, they, they need to know that there is a God. If I'm talking to an atheist, where do I need to start? I, I got to start with there's a God. You don't even believe that there's a God. That's where we need to go. What is helpful as you share your testimony? What needs to be understood? My job is to teach this person to obey all that God has commanded. That's where I need to go. Next, if we look specifically at verses 6 through 10, what does... Paul do, he points to God's word, which is what we need to do as well. But he does it 
uh, as he got a specific revelation directly from God, which is not what we get. We have his word, which is a direct revelation. Uh, It is a special revelation to us, but we are not hearing God's audible voice now. We need to point back to God's word. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. He's the one who's going to do the work. Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. Another passage that we, we love, we always go back to. Why is God's word so important? Because it's not going to return void. It's going to accomplish what he has set out to do. So we always want to point people back to God's word. The basis for what Paul did, the change in him, the actions he took afterward, it's all founded on what God said to him. This is what Jesus told me to do. He told me about my state. You are persecuting me, so you need to stop. You need to go over here and do this and do what I tell you. So I needed to obey. I had to respond rightly to it. It's not different from us. As we look through uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, it's very helpful to look through uh, and go back to that scripture as we're explaining our testimony. This isn't just my idea. This isn't how I think we get saved. This isn't uh, what I feel like we should do to be saved. No, this is clearly what God has said to be saved. This isn't my best thoughts. Are you confident that your testimony is what it is because it's what God said to do, how God said to respond to the gospel. If you have trouble with this, you can play what I call the toddler game. You make a statement and the other person responds, why? Well, I believe there's a God. Why? Well, because the Bible says there's a God. Why? And you can just keep going back. I, I repented of my sin. I turn away from my sin. Why? Because God says to do that. When did he say to do that? Uh, oh, that's a, good, that's a good point. Maybe I should get some, some verses in my mind on, on where repentance is. Where do I see that? Where do I see repentance and faith? Acts 20, 21, if you need it there. Easy one. Now, uh, remember, remembering back, as we look at these verses, uh, remember back to what Pastor Matt started out with, which was just a story that was confused, muddled, and probably you were getting whiplash from going back and forth of, uh, we're at the story. Oh, wait, no, we're explaining the story. Uh, We're going back, and we're going to the future of what happened in the story, and all over the place. Don't give them scripture whiplash. As you are implementing your testimony, as you're going through it, you go to passages that are helpful for the point that you're trying to make. If you are talking to someone else who calls themselves a Christian, I don't think you necessarily need to go back to, well, Genesis 1-1 says that there is a God. I I think we already agree on that. I think we're we're good on that basis. So I don't need to go to that scripture. What what parts do I need to go to? If if you are a person who is uh, believing in your own self-righteousness, okay, well, then those are the scriptures that I need to bring in. Those are the ones that I want to highlight. That's what I want to get to with my testimony. I think what, what needs to be corrected in their thinking, and then how can I, as Pastor Elliot said, walk, them th- walk with them through Scripture? How can I walk alongside them? Yeah, uh, John 3.16 is a, a great Scripture, but I don't think it's helpful necessarily if you're talking to a person who thinks, well, I intellectually agree that there was a Jesus, and so therefore I'm saved. I don't think that's necessarily helpful. Uh, maybe let's instead go to James, where James is making the argument of, I don't care what you say you believe, it, it's going to show up in your actions. Have you truly repented? Are you doing what you say you believe? That's where you go. Ultimately, we want to show, uh, show the people, whoever we're talking about in this evangelistic, specifically, conversation, what God has said about their state, his gracious offer of salvation, and how we should respond. And to do that, we need to make sure that we, as we implement our testimonies, we ensure the hearer knows how to respond. We have to make sure they understand it. They know how to respond. Peter's testimony uh, is great in Acts 2 as he is talking to the people. 
And he shares with them, hey, this is how the Holy Spirit's coming on us. It was prophesied before. Jesus said it would happen. It's happening now. That is the testimony of what's going on right now at this moment. That's Acts 2 um, earlier in the chapter, but specifically verses 37 and 38 says this, as he is talking to them and he's telling them their predicaments, he begs the question from them. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? What do I need to do? What should my response be? And of course, what is Peter's answer? Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Paul does a great job of this as well. If you go back to Acts 17, Acts 17 verses 22 to 31 is the um, portion of scripture where Paul is at the Areopagus and he is talking to all of the Greeks and he's talking to them about their idols and how there's only one true God. And he says this in 30, 31, the times of ignorance got overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, uh, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Again, he tells them, God is commanding all people to repent. That's what you need to do. He does it later on uh, in Acts 26 as well. Acts 26, 26 to 29, as he has uh, just given his testimony uh, of salvation, also a legal defense at the same time, uh, but he wants to get the gospel out there. And so he gives this testimony before King Agrippa. Verse 27, King Agrippa sa uh, he says to King Agrippa, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Agrippa knows exactly what he's doing. He's a smart guy. Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. He always got to the point, what do you need to do about it now? He never stopped at just, here's the story of how God saved me. You've got a great story now. Okay, bye. No, he always got to, this is how you need to respond that's what we need to do as well. We have to get there in our evangelism. They should understand their plight before a holy and just God. There needs to be an urgency to the gospel. You can look up 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 2. It's helpful on that, talking about the day of salvation. Today is the day. It's a favorable time. Now, during all of this, uh, Paul even though there's a, a lot of instances where Paul uses his um, testimony, he doesn't always use it like he doesn't at the Areopagus. He doesn't always use his testimony. And for that, we can look at verses 17 and 18, and we need to be wise with our testimony. Be wise with your testimony. Looking at uh, chapter 22, Acts 22, verses 17 and 18, says, when I returned to Jerusalem, was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, this is Jesus, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. They're not gonna accept it. He doesn't say they're not gonna accept it, but tell them anyway, they're not gonna accept it, but you stick with it and you stay there and you tell them. He's saying, yeah, you're gonna get out of there quickly because they're not going to accept it. So I've got other people that you need to go talk to. I'm going to send you far away to the Gentiles eventually in 21. That's what he says. We need to be wise with who we share our testimony with. These people hated Christ. They were against him. In the instance of the Areopagus, the people uh, have no frame of reference for what he's talking about. If Peter were to, or I'm sorry, if Paul were to get up there and start saying, well, I'm a Jew, I'm a Pharisee. They're like, what's a Pharisee? What? I think I've heard of Jews. You guys are from down in Jerusalem. What's, what's a Pharisee? He starts talking about the, the Mosaic law and they're like, oh, okay, you have laws? Cool. I don't, I don't really know what you're talking about. We're Greek over here. We don't really deal with you guys. We got a whole pantheon of gods. That's what we're all doing here. They have no frame of reference for what he would talk about. As he talks about sin and transgression and the holiness of God, they're like, what do you mean? Gods are just wanting our attention sometimes and wanting things from us. That's all they care about. That's their frame of reference for gods. It's not helpful to go into his testimony in this situation. It doesn't matter that Jesus is called the Christ. As he's saying, Jesus is the Messiah. They're like, what word is that? 
I don't understand. Make sure that you are using your testimony in a wise way. Don't fight for your testimony's legitimacy. Paul didn't even use his amazing testimony every time he shared the gospel. But lastly, when you wisely are using your testimony, uh, if you do use it and they don't accept it because we don't have the divine revelation from God, uh, before I go out to Tiller Days, I'm not hearing, okay, talk to the second guy, the third guy, share your testimony, but the last guy don't because he's not going to listen to you. I don't get that. I just go out and I, I share I want to be wise in how I do it. Would my testimony be helpful in this situation? Can I use it to diffuse the situation, gain credibility, to correct your theology, to point you to God's word, to ensure that you know how to respond? But we, not, we need to make sure that we don't fight for your story and forget the gospel. This is God's word that will save, not your story. That is where we need to go. Your goal is to share the gospel. And as we go out as a church to do just that, we are going to be effective as we use the tools that God has given us. And this is an incredible tool, your testimony. I hope you guys are excited as we are to talk about testimonies at Tiller Days, at Compass Carnival, at all these different things. We're going to have a board up with a question that gets people talking about testimonies. So you're going to already have the leg up as you go back to your small groups and dwell richly start up. And uh, even as you serve tomorrow in some ministry post, be talking with people. Man, we're excited about testimonies. You know the power that we have in our testimonies? I'm excited to share my testimony with a non-believer so that they would see the power and the excellence of God. That's what we need to be about. That's what we should be focusing on. So let's pray right now. We'll grab some food afterwards and then we'll come back for some Q&A. But let's pray and get ready uh, for the rest of our afternoon and day here. God, we thank you so much for what you have given us, the incredible gift that we have in our testimonies. God, it is a powerful spiritual weapon that can destroy strongholds as people cling to their man-made religion, to their self-reliance, their self-righteousness, as they cling to idols to bring them pleasure, to bring them satisfaction, uh, to bring them glory, to bring them salvation. God, we can use our testimonies to tear those down and to show them the folly of it. And then we want to take uh, your word and walk them through what your word says and show them how to truly be saved, how to truly live a life that is pleasing to you, how to live a, a life that is meaningful because it's the life that you purposed for us is what we are supposed to do, which is bring glory to you as your image bearers. God, I pray that every single person here, anyone who watches this later, would be encouraged about their testimony, that they would be excited to go out and implement their testimony. But God, they would also be wise in how they do it, not just sharing a story because they're excited, but God, using it to get to the gospel, using it to put a spotlight on you because that is what a testimony is supposed to do. God, we thank you for all this time with our brothers and sisters here. Uh, I pray that we would uh, have great encouragement as we leave this place today and that we would go out and share your gospel uh, with great joy and excitement to one day hear from you. Well done, good and faithful servant. We pray these things in your name. Amen.